In a world where people actually watch the stuff their friends recommend, this is I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. Something else. Got a person in a movie? You do know about that. Yes, indeedy, ma'am. We'll be seeing you here tonight. Not this character. You won't be seeing him. Not till they find an actor for him. Mostly we're just supposed to feel him, spying on the boy. And on the girl, too, of course. From the shadows. Am I quoting you correctly? Of course I am. Of course. She has total recall. And a perfectly splendid imagination. Oh, don't try and be cute. Just answer the question. Would you just repeat it, please? I didn't think you asked anything. Well, I guess I haven't asked it. I just want to know what he represents. Well, as I conceive of it, this character in the film, well, he's, he's sort of a hermit living out there. There is a possibility. A peeping Tom. You tell us. This part we didn't cast, this old man. He's Hannaford. Hannaford himself. Hannaford! <laughs> Whew, that moves so fast like a 70s style smash zoom. Did she ask a question? Or did she just trick me into asking one for her right now? Genius. Greetings, lookers! Welcome to this edition of I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine, the podcast that's one part movie discussion, one part game show where we never know what we'll be watching next. I'll be your host, Ben Mitchell, and you can find me on Twitter and most social media with the handle at Red Hen Media One. Look for that red hen icon. And our theme for series four is mockumentaries. And today we'll be discussing The Other Side of the Wind 2018, which is a mockumentary drama feature film that's currently streaming on Netflix. Yes, The Other Side of the Wind, aka Scene Missing. Subtitle, what happens when you're used to shooting with a second unit and completely overlook shooting any inserts for your indie comeback movie whatsoever? And I'm here with my distinguished co-hosts who are likely talking behind my back, so let's join their conversation already in progress. Hey, gang. Hey. Hi. With us today, she's simultaneously credible and incredible, the anomaly, Kat Ramirez. Hey, y'all. Just like I'm always real with my friends and family, I'll always keep it real with y'all, too, as always grateful to be here. Very grateful to have you. And the provocative one, Mr. Devin Schwartz. The game is on. And my good friend, the incendiary, James Pepe. Hey everyone, it's me. And in, in honor of our movie tonight, I'm having I'm having a drink while we record. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll I'll stab a big inflatable penis by the end of the night. <laughs> one one hopes. Yeah, just one. If, well, I mean, I they come, in, go a, through they come a all in one night. You know? I know that's true. You gotta meet it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say meet it out or oh yeah, it out? absolutely. Oh, oh well, okay, yeah. I, either, either one would work. Yeah. <laughs> and with us also the irrepressible gentleman Jim Scott. Hey, Jim. Hey, and greetings, gentle listeners and friends. Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. And greetings to our listeners and friends. There's the rundown you asked for. I may have expanded some areas that you weren't prepared for. Great. But I think... Fax that to everyone on the distribution list. Um, sure. Do you want to look at it first? Do I need to? No. No, no, I just want to make sure we have the same format. Got to get that format right. Our boss, Charles Miner, just demanded a rundown and... Jim from the office just handed the dossier to James Pepe. So let's see what James has for us on the other side of the wind. Yeah. So once again, I was saddled with trying to explain this movie. Um, 
So I guess, so first of all, so this was a movie that um, Orson Welles had been trying to make for a long time. Um, and it was supposed to be his big comeback movie, but because of all sorts of different things, he died before he was able to finish it. And then the production, this production company that eventually released it got the rights to it, um, stitched it together, trying to stay as sort of, um, you know, uh, trying to stick as close to his notes and sort of um, what his intention was and put it together in, in the best way that they could to represent what they thought his vision was wells esque if you will orwellian uh <laughs> orson wellian <laughs> yeah um so the plot uh this is a little bit of a tough one so the i guess so this the movie is about um so john houston who is a movie director who you may know as the director of Chinatown, one of the best movies ever made, and also Wise Blood, to just name a few. Um, he plays the main character who's a movie director and is in a sort of similar situation. He's trying to make this sort of like comeback movie, but he's sort of from the old school of filmmaking, and he's trying to like break back onto the scene by making a film that's more like the like what the hip young kids of the 70s are making, the 60s and 70s <laughs> are Perfect. doing. Um, and he is bedeviled by many ancillary characters. Um, and, but we also get to see a lot of the movie that he is making in the movie. So, uh, 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 a non, non insignificant percentage of the movie is, um, you know, a film of the movie that the character in the movie is supposed to be making. Right, right. Yeah. Too bad Shakespeare never thought of that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, this movie is a defies description in, a, in some sense because it really is a sort of like art house movie. It's a piece, it's really a piece of art and it sort of has to be experienced to be appreciated. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, it, it defies description a little bit. Yeah, I'd say it's meta before meta became like uh, a word. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of people in this movie. There's a lot of actors and actresses that I just didn't recognize. But like I said, John Huston, he's the main character of the movie. He's playing the director. Um, Susan Strasberg is sort of the film critic who is constantly sort of like, like I said, sort of like bedeviling him with these questions. Um, Dennis Hopper also makes a very brief appearance in it, which I was happy to see. And uh, Peter Bogdanovich, um, who uh, went on to have somewhat of a career, um, more than the other people in this movie, I think at least. But he also had a hand in sort of putting the movie together and releasing it. So he's in the movie and also had a hand in the, this movie that was as it was eventually released. Oh, well, that's cool. Did you happen yeah. to watch the documentary that kind of came along with this one on Netflix? No, I didn't. Yeah, me neither. That I'm sure it would have been like a, it's supposed to be a companion piece, my opinion of the movie going through or, you know, so I didn't watch it, but I yeah. plan on checking it out at some point. It seems neat. It's called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which came oh, out. That, I, I do remember. It, yeah. I do remember it coming out. I haven't seen it though, and I didn't know that this was like a companion piece to it. Yeah, and so this this won um, a bunch of sort of like regional awards. I'm just looking at the list here. Um, none of these really like scream out at me as being big. No register worthy. Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of these are like Boston Society of Film, Chicago Film Critics, uh, Hollywood Post Alliance. I don't, you know, I've never heard of some of these things, but um, yeah, so. Uh, I think that's all I have for you. And of it course, didn't, it didn't blow the gates needs off no... of the, uh, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's more about like, do you want to see Orson Welles' last film? Right, yeah. Which, yes, the answer is yes. Right, yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it did win uh, when it holds a record for the longest film ever in production, 48 years. Wow. So yeah, I serious. guess from when he... No, it couldn't have been when he... Did. Okay, so from when it started, I guess, pre-production to when it was released in 2018, I imagine. So do the math if you want. But uh, a while. So it holds a record. Um, well, I, I don't know if that's registered worthy. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> No, that's for uh, our listeners at home who are all math whizzes, I'm assuming. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, so any other uh, weird factoids or anything that we need to know? Uh, no, I guess I guess maybe just if you're thinking about watching this movie, there's a lot of nudity in it, and there's a lot of, like, drinking and sort of... Yeah, there's a lot of nudity in it. The people in the movie that... Uh, is being made by the character in the movie. They're basically nude the entire time, both the the woman and the man. Um, although so, we get to see more of the woman's uh, bits than of the man's, I suppose. There's also a uh, character portraying a Native American person who is not Native American. Oh, right. Yes. Ah, so typical. Yeah, 70s she's uh, Scandinavian, there. I think, or something. I looked it up because yeah, I was Croatian. like, she doesn't look Native American to me. Oh, Croatian. There we go. She couldn't yeah, have they... like a less Native American sounding name. No, and when they said she was a Native American in the movie, I was like, she is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't look it. Anyway. I couldn't tell um, if they were like hanging a lampshade on it and being like, this lady is clearly not Native American. Yeah, I actually thought that was going to be like, I thought the actress in in the movie wasn't, but like she was portraying it in his movie in the movie. And then uh, they called her, they call her an Indian in the, in the fil- outside of the film. Yeah. It's so meta. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. One of my issues was trying to figure this out thing out enough to sort of get grounded enough to enjoy it um but we'll we'll get to that and that's one of those things it's it's one of those things where um you sometimes i i guess it's supposed to be satire but sometimes i wasn't sure it's it's one of those so this should make for an interesting conversation um but before we get ahead of ourselves we got to figure out who done it That's right. We have reached the segment where we guess and reveal who is responsible for this week's submission. And winner with the most guesses at the end of this series will win a Who Dundee Award. Um, so I'm going to I I'm gonna stick with Jim because <laughs> yeah. against all yeah, against <laughs> all instincts, because I've guessed Jim every single time and I just OCD style do not want to break that pattern. So I'm going to guess Jim. Cat, what oh, do you man. think? I can only say Jim. Watch me so be I'm right. Gonna go. I can only say yeah. Jim. So um, Jim, you know, for obvious reasons, clearly. Well, I think he done it. I think he looks guilty <laughs> sitting on that couch. All right, Devin, who done it? <laughs> if if this was Jim's movie, God is my witness, I will eat my notepad. This is clearly Kat's movie. This is all this is a movie about filmmakers. It, it seems like like I don't know, does not give me a single Jim vibe at all. Um, Jim, I no, yeah, not I, at all. I cannot imagine this being your. I'm film, hoping Jim, but, that he was trying to just throw us all off. Um, yeah, and if he does, <laughs> maybe, I won't maybe. hold you to actually eating it. If you want to eat it like Cookie Monster style. Just kind of make a big thing out of it and kind of throw it towards your mouth and om nom nom. That will be mm-hmm, fine. Mm-hmm. So I really hope that uh, Jim did it now. All right. Pepe, who I, done I, it? I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't Go know. It would be, be pretty funny to watch him eat a notepad. Uh, uh, yeah. Jim's just going to Jim's just gonna text Cat real quick and say, like, say it wasn't your film so we can uh, watch him eat yeah. it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The producers will be watching for any cheating there. So, uh, Pepe, <laughs> who done it? Man, if you got, <laughs> yeah, I, it seems like people seem to have an easy time picking my movies, but this has got to be the easiest, <laughs> easiest choice that's ever been presented on this show. Uh, so I'm going to pick Jim. No, I'm going to pick Cat. This is Cat's movie. Oh, too late. No. Okay. Oh, no. So, uh, yeah, you said, cake. you said death. <laughs> yep. That's right. Yeah, you took your yeah, finger yeah, off. That's right. Yeah. You took your finger off the piece. Oh, man. The move is done. Yep. No cake for you. It was a lie anyway. 
Okay, Jim, who done it? Well, uh, for the same reasons Cat has declared, I must declare Cat in the Shamrock, Shamrock Green ambience. You did it. Yeah, and a beautiful ambience it is. Nice choice, uh, mm-hmm. color choice for tonight. Okay, so who has the most votes? I think, I think yeah, cat two to three. Okay, cat. Uh-huh. Since you have three votes, why don't we find out if you done it? Did you done it, cat? I don't know if you're gonna play the noise or not. Sorry. Um. So it was me. Yeah. That is correct. Really? Yeah. Um, you surprise, know, I was, surprise. I was thinking, I was like, if this was like me versus Ben, would it have been more difficult? Yeah, yeah watching yes. that, watching it, I agree. I was like, this is Ben's movie. Wait, what happened? How did Ben get two movies in here? This is so clearly Ben's movie. Uh-huh. If, if it had been me, I really wanted to vote for myself ben, too. Yeah. That would have been yeah, a hard exactly. one. Yeah, yeah and exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was more and I also timing. Thought, yeah, I thought of Pepe as well too. So, like out of anyone this could have been uh, up against this is like the most easiest decision to make in in regards to like me versus jim's like taste in, in movies so i yeah you guys really have this <laughs> in the if, in if the it had been Devin, that would have been a pretty easy choice too there, there was no way Devin would watch this movie like under his own volition yeah had fate uh determined that this was our first film uh it would have been all over the place i'm sure yeah. Yeah. But uh, as it, as it is, I was like, yes, Cat definitely wants to talk about this for several reasons. So, which which we will get to that. But first, um now that we know who done it, it's time to uh explain why done it. <laughs> uh so yeah, this was definitely um like I said, I had a class about documentaries and we talked about Air Witch Project as a mockumentary. Um, so we kind of went into that specific genre of mockumentaries. And um, this was something that I stumbled upon on like one day, you know, one of the days I was looking at movies on Netflix, I think after it came out uh, recently that I was like, oh, this looks interesting. And I'm, I'm familiar with the name. So why not? Um, and I watched it. And I couldn't help but think about the fact that the mockumentary genre is very defined by either, you know, satire that is comical, um, which we've had earlier in the season, or um, horror, which we've also had early in the season. Um, So this was very different in that sense, because of the fact that it was it's a drama, it is satire, but it's done and there is definitely humor to it. Um, but it's, it's different than those other two genres within that has made the mock mockumentaries the genre that it is. So to break away from that mold, I thought was very unique and different on top of the fact that independent of it being a mockumentary, the way that it's shot, the fact that this took so many years of producing, um, of course, who the director for this film is. Like there's so much going into this film that anyone who's into movies, I feel like should know about, even if they don't like it, even if they don't, you know, you know, enjoyed the movie, uh, which I did, but I feel like it's one of those movies that you should watch if you're into movies. I don't know. Like, it's just something you have to do. It's a, it's like a homework assignment, even if you don't enjoy it. Oh, um, totally. Totally. And it's different. All right. Yeah, and it is, it's very different. Um, but it also holds a lot of like the, co- like for me, it, it has a lot of that, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the elements that I love about films. Like, you know, and it is yeah. a more artistic kind, but even in the, in the mockumentary sense of kind of making fun of, um, of a time period in Hollywood filmmaking, it's still like, I don't know. It was nostalgic in in a way that, that I enjoyed. Yeah. We'll get into that. No. Yeah, totally. And as far as your style, did anyone else get Malcolm and Marie vibes from this? Just kind of like Hollywood turning the lens on itself sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. in in that respect. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, now that you mentioned it. Yeah. 
Yeah, right, same. Yeah. Well, well, watching it, I didn't like, get it, but yeah. With the critic, like, kind of being kind of the thorn in his side, etc. Um, yeah, um, the other thing that was tough for me going into this one was I had no idea what it was. I purposely didn't look it up beforehand. I had no idea what it was about or what to expect. And that sort of threw me for a loop. And it was it was because it was from a bygone era. It some of the stuff I think just didn't land as intended. Um, like like Pepe pointed out, it was like, oh, let's do this young hip filmmaking from the seventies. But it's like now we're looking back, you know, forty plus years at the seventies, and so it's just that looking at it through that lens was just strange, but. As I watched, uh, which has happened several times during the show, I I was finally able to settle in sometime in the, maybe like after the first third of the film, I sort of understood where they might be going with it and um, withheld any judgment and just kind of sat down and was along for the ride. Um, one of the weirdest parts from the beginning I noticed was everyone had a smoker's voice and that's just like quite extinct in Hollywood now. So it took some getting used to that. Just everyone had that kind of raspy smoker thing. Although, uh, John Houston, um, has a freaking amazing voice. Um, I know him best as Gandalf from the seventies Hobbit cartoon. Anyone else uh, remember that one? Oh yeah. Uh, the original Gandalf, right? Uh, oh, yeah. The Rankin Bass one. <clears throat> was it, I wasn't think, that, it I think Bass? that's the studio. Yeah. Um, it's the actual 2d cell animated one. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh which he was excellent in. Um, and so all I heard was like Gandalf being drunk and like berating people for the, for the whole movie, <laughs> which I enjoyed because John Houston's voice is great. Um, it also felt like me, like uh, it was sort of because Orson Welles was behind it and helming it, it, it felt like a 1940s filmmaking uh, on pet pills, like taking place in the 70s. All those smash zooms and everything. Speaking of going in blind, I uh, I had kind of a roller coaster ride. I was talking to Pepe about this earlier off the off air, but uh, I initially when we first announced the film last week, googled it. Usually, I'm looking up the runtime just so I can like kind of plan when to watch it, um, and uh, saw the poster, just like the black and white poster, and I was like, oh, it's an old movie, and I was like, that's great, another old fucking black and white movie these people are making me watch, and uh, so I was like, yeah, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> And then I got to actually watching it and I saw it was 2018 and I was like, oh, I guess it's a period piece. That's what it is. OK. And I started watching it. And then as I was watching it, I was like, wow, this is a very well-made period piece. This looks exactly <laughs> like the 70s. This is like, how are they doing this? Everything looks exactly right. And I was like, this is incredible. It's like it's like a genius film. And then I was like, wait. And then I Googled it while I was watching it. And I was like, OK, no. Is this not what I'm thinking of at all? Yes, yeah, so I was like back period forth. piece ever. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, my opinion was through the roof until I found out that. Oh, then it dropped significantly, or how, for, well, first well, of all, plus the best. <laughs> okay, so who's seen it? Has anyone else seen this other than Cat? I hadn't. No, no, no. So Cat, you were the only one who saw, it. and it was because of a. I did guess that something from some class spurned you towards watching this one. I don't know how this one got past my my radar, actually. But uh, I guessed that right. And I also guessed that you wanted to discuss certain parts of this film. Um, I know there's certain parts I wanted to get into. And one of those is what I briefly mentioned was uh, it, it was like they were satiring the kind of machismo 70s thing. Uh, however, at what point do they cross the threshold of just exploiting the same tropes in actually using them um and did this film do that by your guys's estimation and Devin, i also want to hear from you about this because there was i what i would classify as gratuitous nudity i mean yeah i'll i'll just jump in first and say that uh i think this film was really hard to read as satire honest like i know that it's conceptually supposed to be because i saw that right. in the, like the wikipedia page but i I don't know. It really just felt like, uh, like you know, here's all the great stuff we love about the seventies, and like you know, here's naked women. Here's uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I just uh, it was very strange. The the opening scene uh, with like there's like an orgy of women, and one of them has like a strap on on, and I don't know if that was supposed yeah. to be part of his film because that doesn't seem like it matches anything else they showed about his his film, or if that was a different film he was like on the set of. 
I, I don't know. But yeah, none of it to me really read a satire as I was as I was watching it. Maybe if I went back through with a fine tooth comb, I could kind of find those bits. But yeah, it just felt like they're, they just felt exploitative. Yeah, it felt like the to me like this the satirical part of using gratuitous nudity was more just to try to draw people in via the nudity. Uh, and remember, this is before the era of the internet, so seeing nudity was like a really, really big deal that didn't happen yeah. that much. You would then. react. You would react like that professor who's like in the in the booth watching the movie through it uh, in right. the in the house, just mesmerized. Mister Silas, yeah. she's showing her ankles. <laughs> All for Silas <laughs> Simpsons joke. Well, the, the nudity in the movie kind of reminded me, for whatever reason, of like the Emmanuel movies, like Emmanuel and Bangkok and stuff like that. Just the way it was shot, which is very reminiscent of those movies. Which I'm not familiar with. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I wa I watched them growing up. They were the type of movies that would be on Cinemax after dark or like Showtime. Okay. You, you, you know what I mean? I'm surely and, not familiar with that then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no way I stayed up after my parents went to bed to check those out. Come on. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it did feel like that to me too. But Kat, go ahead. You have something to, to uh add here. Yeah. Um I think that this one I mean it's very meta, so I understand I think it is confusing for a lot of you know, it's reasonably confusing, like for viewers, I think. Um whether it's done intentionally, it probably, I am assuming. I don't see someone like Orson Welles not. And I understand that the editing process of it all was not done completely by him. Obviously, he died in, before the end of the, the, the finishing of the movie. But um, I think Fair his point. vision, um, based off of what I read, he wanted to do a movie about, it was shortly, he got inspired shortly after Ernest Hemingway died. And he wanted to do a movie that was about a director who was similar to Hemingway and very like machismo in that sense um, as well. So I think that if you question whether or not the things that maybe you find, I don't know, problematic about this movie, I am going to give it the benefit of doubt that it is done intentionally. Like, and I think also this Croatian woman playing a Native American woman is also was also done intentionally and um in part that this film w is 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 um uh, labeled as an american french film so there's kind of um i'm not quite sure why on what i don't know if wells is french in it i'm assuming he's just an american director i don't think so i so, i think i read that they were trying to do it in the french new wave style yeah. or at least harken back to that or something but i don't know they might have had French money or a producer from there or something. I'm not sure. Well, at least that made me question that there can be a criticism of American films and American Hollywood films and the way that they, oh, good point. they exploit nudity to it being like a, a pornographic thing versus like, you know, culturally speaking, as far as I'm aware, like French people tend to view nudity as a norm, much more norm lot less sexualized so i feel like a lot of that would pinpoint to this to a lot of the things that we find as like an issue with this movie because yes i'm i'm with you like obviously having a white someone who's not native american play as a native american is that problematic sure but did that happen in the 70s for hollywood most likely i'm pretty sure like that's not mm -hmm. um a bizarre yeah, and still or uncommon thing and it still happens now so um right yeah, so I would I would at least argue that it those things were done intentionally and not just done unknowingly or, you know, as part of the film without the director being aware of it. I think he tried to specifically play into a lot of the tropes that happens in the Hollywood film industry, not Hollywood films, but Hollywood film industry. So and I think personally, I think he did a good job in that, too. Um like mm -hmm. no he did a good so. job of of putting that on display um i just wonder at what point they it, the movie starts exploiting it for the very thing that they're trying to send up but i mean it's so meta it's hard to draw that line i'll say that it wasn't like overtly offensive to me but i didn't note it 
you know, as part of the sort of watching experience and reflecting as I watched it. Um, did it bother you, Devin? Because I know this is a, a subject that's a, a specific kind of thing for you. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely it felt unnecessary. It wasn't as like uncomfortable as some of the other, you know, films like Under the Skin, obviously. You know, it wasn't like uh, uh, upsetting in that way, but it was certainly like, you know, like why, why, why are we looking at this woman nude in very slow motion for like nine uninterrupted minutes? Uh, you know, and like uh, also within the film, why the characters that in this film that they're making are nude so often in this like weird art film they're making where they're just like constantly naked for one reason or another. Um, so it was like, both, it was within both films that this problem existed. And uh, I, I just feel like it begs the question of like, at what point is something satire, you know, like wh where is that like invisible line where like, you know, now it's satire because like, you know, are the, are the, uh, uh, Michael Bay Transformers movies satire because you could certainly watch those movies with a certain eye towards like you know satirizing action films and they would maybe seem like satire if you like thought about them that way because they're like totally over the top and ridiculous I, I think, and almost like a parody. Well, I think the big thing with satire, including novels, um, is when the author is intentionally writing that piece or doing that piece to as a criticism of whatever subject he's at he or she is satirizing so if orson wells had had done this movie without any intention of satirizing machismo in hollywood or anything like that then of course even if you can maybe like analyze it and say well is is this a satirical point you would it would be hard to make that argument because that that wasn't the intention on behalf of the person creating the content does that make sense like you satire is always is something that the the person writing it or doing it or creating it intentionally does into going into the into making it if that makes sense yeah if i yeah. might jump in uh also if you're going to satirize something successfully you should at some point be making some kind of comment on it and maybe that comment should be a scare quote loud enough that we know that you're satiri satirizing it um maybe at least the line shouldn't be invisible um would be one thought uh, another thought is that since this as you were talking about this i did realize it plays into the the director's character john houston's character um because he is wearing that machismo and that masculinity uh kind of as a mask um for being in the closet right uh, or at least that's what's heavily implied in this. So I'm wondering uh -huh. if putting that into the film, um, and the film is, they do, they're representing the film as bad. They're not saying this is a great film within this film. Um, so maybe it's just like his, his lie is just kind of growing thin or whatever, and it's just blatantly over the top because he's trying to convince everyone else or himself or something of, uh, of that lie. Um, and I had something else, but I'll get back to it. But uh, that that kind of uh, struck me as you guys were talking about it. Um, but what what do you guys think? I mean, does that I'm, does that make I'm sense? I'm curious. I'm curious what leads you to believe that he that at all. I got the he had that conversation with that man where the man implied like implied in his speech that he was in the closet but i got no implication from the film that, that was i true. don't know if it was true or not but they but the implied uh, a lot it was implied a few times during the movie and and overtly when he slapped the uh journalist at the end there oh we lost Devin. he i'm sorry, he sorry and, and bounced okay but uh, jim you had <laughs> something to say there yeah well uh, first of all um it, yeah satire uh going back to your point cat satire is always intentional because satire is subtle you know and it has to be an intentional device um but you know this movie is very chaotic there's a lot of voices going on saying mm -hmm. different things um so some of the things that they're saying you almost got a piece like one line of dialogue that was said earlier in the movie and then run it through. And I wasn't even thinking that he was a closet homosexual, but now that you guys have mentioned it, I can kind of see it. So 
some of the evidence that I can see, um, there was a line that one, I don't know if it was the professor, uh, the type of character that was the brains. They said he was a brains. He was a screenwriter, I, I think. Right. He, he said something about he's good at smelling other people's wrinkles. Um, and that suggests to me some of the, you know, life trials or life experiences or maybe even things that are hidden underneath the surface. So that kind of told me to start paying attention to what all of this dialogue is trying to say. Um, another part, uh, when he talks about how the director finds these young men and fashions them um, into leading roles, but they use like the fisherman analogy, uh, especially for the latest person. Uh, and it was done a couple of times. He was fish out of the sea. They described it as a master and slave relationship, um, trained to be a sailor. And then later on in the movie, they said mutual jack off, which that's, you know, could be termed as gay, gay sexual. Um, the other uh, aspect. I think they mentioned Roman at some point and. Oh, part of that Roman, you know, the older person, mentor, and the younger man, the fact that they're inseparable, they're always in the same room, they're following each other, that type of thing. And then I think when uh, they were talking about the director being kind of the hidden peeping Tom in, right. the, in the movie, uh, and that is very much, I mean... It's kind of perverted, but it's like, you know, he, he wants to watch. But it, it is not implied who he wants to watch, right? Does he want to watch both of them? Does he want to watch uh, the young man? Does he want to watch the young woman? So there's a lot of like, it's not, you're not sure. So I feel like for those things that I picked up um, out of the movie, I, I, I think that there is definitely, you know, um, kind of a jab. Uh, and, and and just knowing what I know of like Hollywood, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there were a lot of closet homosexuals, you know, actors, yeah. no choice, uh, directors. I mean, yeah. You don't want to get blacklisted by being who you are. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, it was a thing. Um, I'll run a clip real quick uh, where he's giving direction to the young man, the young male actor and kind of talking in the sense that Jim was talking about. Somebody's watching you. You can feel it. There's somebody else out there. Up there in that window. There's nothing behind that window. They're all the same. There's somebody up there peeking down. Did he drop the scissors? So I got that clip because specifically because um, that's a rare way to give direction when someone's on the set. I know that's kind of a cliche thing, like while the acting is going on, you're directing the actor, but that's not really done all that much unless the blocking needs to be done. So I've seen it done a couple of times and I've done it maybe once, but typically you give your direction in between takes. But um, But really that serves to kind of illustrate Jim's point, I think, in that he's, they're kind of playing romantic music when he's talking softly to him and stuff, and it was kind of erotic in, in a way, the way he was talking mm -hmm. to him, I thought. Um, and uh, the other time they mentioned it, oh, and here's something. Um, I, I am not down with the 70s lingo. Was Oscar like a term for someone who was gay or something back then? Because they mentioned it in this um, clip a couple times. Sorry. I was going to say, uh, I, I was, okay. All right. I, I, I don't know. I obviously wasn't born in that area, but um, Oscar Wilde was referenced and Oscar 
Wilde was, um, he's, he wrote the picture of Dorian Gray, but he is an older author who was also closeted, but like well known that he was gay. And I believe he was like killed for it. I, I think he went on trial and was killed for it, for being gay. Jesus. So, um, yeah, I could. So when I heard that reference, I was like, okay, now I get it because I understand the history be, behind Oscar Wilde. So I can see maybe in the 70s. That okay, it was I didn't know. That. Now that you uh-huh. mentioned, I remember them saying Oscar Wilde, but I just heard them mention Oscar and he made the joke about the Oscar. And I was like, is, that's clearly something either from another era or it's going over my head. Um, did you did you recognize that, Jim? You had something to say. Yeah, I, I think it's Oscar Wilde. And unfortunately, it was tragic for Oscar Wilde. And in that a- in that aspect, he was um, when that sc- the English teacher uh, was trying to out the director. Um, right, which I'll play in him a second. And, yeah, him implying, uh, you know, because of the, the, that young a- actor that he had in this final film, um, his real name was Oscar. You know, his stage name was that, that other one. And oh, yeah. um, how, how it was kind of floated around the school that he was a closet, you know. Yeah, he says uh, something the, like, the, it's too bad his name was Oscar or it was ironic or something like that, so... That's when it first yeah. like, stuck in my craw. Like, what What am I missing here? Yeah, and I think he was trying, you know, because maybe back in the in the seventies and stuff. Like, if you were on the hunt, you know, to find out if somebody was, you know, a homosexual, you would look for clues like that. And the things he said about the kid were really jabs at the director. Yeah, and it was actually one of my favorite scenes as far as acting. And having like a showdown between the two, like a, mm-hmm. a sparring uh, session between the two uh, scene partners there, which was John yeah. Houston and the school teacher. I don't know, but I'll, I'll play the clip. Uh, it, it, the acting was pretty good. And it also goes to sort of uh, show the, the point that um, there, there may have been something going on there. There's something where he's trying to overcompensate with the machismo for one reason or another. And people are like calling him out about it. As you could imagine, with a name like Oscar, what happened to that teacher? We let him go, of course. Let him go? Hmm. What about the police? Hmm. The man was sick, Mr. Hanford. But those young boys, they must have been sick after he finished with them. I hope you're not worried about them. What do you think I should be? Wouldn't that depend, Mr. Hanford, on your own... Personal interest. What are you driving at, Dr. Burroughs? Oh, well, nothing. Nothing. Uh-huh. I'm just his director, not his Aunt Daisy. And I'm just his English teacher. <laughs> but certainly he has every reason to be grateful to you and i'm sure that one day when one of his fine performances gets the academy award why well, you'll be grateful to him uh notice how careful he is not to refer to it as an oscar thought that was a pretty great scene i also thought it was a pretty good twist that the the re- how he discovered the actor was that uh he was i guess his stage name was jake or something he was uh, supposedly in trouble or committing suicide or something like that, and he rescued him. But um, uh, he realized during this that um, the actor was setting him up, like he was kind of conning his way into his life, and that was they referred to that as his audition uh, for the director, which I thought was a pretty cool twist. See, I, that was something that confused me because uh, we, we get that information from that school teacher that we just heard. But then later they say that he is a phony, that he didn't know it, didn't actually know the boy at all. No. Oh, I thought they were calling the kid uh, somebody. A phony. Uh, I see. Again, that's the confusing nature of this film. Um, I, yeah, I, that's I knew I was how gonna... I interpreted it. No, no, that's fine. Because I knew that I was likely getting some things wrong. But what I got from that was that he realized that the boy was a phony and he went off 
to his people in the other room was like, he's a phony. And I thought he was referring to the actor and that he had conned his way in. Did, how did you guys read it? Kat, you're nodding your head. Yeah, that's how I interpreted it. And the context was that he was referring to the actor that was committing suicide, but actually was acting. That he was saying that he was a phony because he was actually acting as an actor. Um, which which was an interesting thing too, because it, you know, obviously that he only wanted this, wanted to discover this person that he saved instead of it being an actual actor as you would typically find as a director for a movie um but there had to be this like romant romanticization of suicide of oh he's gonna commit suicide i'm gonna save him so now i'm i don't know number one hero i don't know that was that was also an interesting point too yeah yeah um i thought it was kind of interesting that um Orson Welles seems to have a pattern in storytelling um, in that uh, that I noticed here that some of, there was some Citizen Kane canery afoot um, in that, you know, the guy we know he's going to die at the end and it's a story about someone who's gone and um, very like news really or this in this in this particular one more like documentary or whatever. Uh, I just find that fascinating when when directors uh, like kind of you you see their themes keep reemerging in their films. Um, although I don't remember much of that in Touch of Evil. Have, has have any of you seen Touch of Evil? It's nineteen fifty. Yeah. I hope we get to that one mm. on this one because as far as Orson Welles outside of Citizen Kane, I would recommend checking that out. It has a really great one right in the beginning that we have to study in film school. You, if you've gone to film school, you've definitely studied that scene. Um, this also reminded me of Columbo. Uh, a lot of Columbo episodes were shot in the 70s, so it's like, oh, I can enjoy this on a Columbo, uh, from a Columbo <laughs> aspect. However, I then I kept expecting someone to be murdered and uh, for Columbo <laughs> to show up. However, this guy, I'll do his clip, sounds just like Columbo, so I was like, damn. That must have been a thing in the 70s to sound like this. And again, it must harken back to smoking. Uh, I'll play that real quick. The word from me certainly couldn't hurt. He's bound to feel some gratitude. Mr. Roderick's a chum. You don't hustle our chums for dough. We're kind of strict about that. Always remember that your heart is God's little God. Is that recorder still running? No. Well, see that it isn't. Well, there's a camera somewhere. Yeah. A couple of them. Studying a man like Jay can't afford, that's an experience. Don't you miss it. Stick with the job. Eat little shit, Mr. Pester. That guy sounds so much like Columbo, I couldn't believe it wasn't him. I was like, wait, is that is that <laughs> Peter Falk? But no, it wasn't. It was <laughs> just his uh, Hollywood non-union sound-alike, apparently. So that was pretty neat. And then uh, in the beginning, they do these kind of interviews, which also this will kind of harken towards what I was saying, where it just kind of had a kind of a Citizen Kane type of thing happening here. Bunch of reporters, you know. Fine, rolling. Hello, hello, hello. OK, I'm ready to go. Just go right ahead and talk, Mr. Hannaford. Don't mind us. I'll go first. Mr. Hannaford, is the camera eye a reflection of reality, or is reality a reflection of the camera eye? Or is the camera merely a phallus? I want a drink. You heard him. Let's get it out here. <laughs> we ought to start with a broader spectrum. Here. Don't you agree, Otter Lake? That's true. The interview's for everybody, not just us. But today there's a special dispensation. Mr. Hannaford, could you please to slow down? Otherwise, I'm going to fall off the car. <laughs> Mr. Hannaford! So yeah, that is pretty funny, but the drinking and the driving is almost like Chekhov's gun for this thing. And we know... Uh, I can't remember if it was in the beginning that they said that he had died or whatever. Was it just on screen yeah. text that like did that or did they actually say it? No, there was a bit, there was a, there was a, I think a voiceover and a picture of him. That's in right. The, of the, the wrecked car. Okay. Okay. So yeah, definitely. It was like kind of foreshadowing or whatever, but also pretty funny. Uh, and then this one is uh, a scene from the film that basically the other aspect of this is, 
And uh, I liked the title, The Other Side of the Wind, because it's like when you're young and you have the wind at your back, you know, and clearly these guys have been working together for decades and, and making movies, you know, in Hollywood and doing that thing and doing the groundbreaking thing, which is very much, I mean, Orson Welles basically a, a lot of, there's a lot of himself in this movie, which is why I said it was so meta. You know, it's really about an old filmmaker trying to make a comeback. Um, and so the other side of the wind is, is maybe when, you know, you don't have the wind at your back and it's kind of the winds have shifted and blowing against you and you're trying to uh, work with your old aging crew to see if you have it in you for one more go of it, right? Um, but uh, here's here's the scene. Uh, here's a scene from the movie when they're trying to... Uh, basically, the story is they're at this party screening this thing for people, trying to get the money people to contribute so they can finish this movie. And they're not doing such a hot job of it. So what are the toys about? Well, be before this, she'll be pretending to look in the window at him. Oh, that is when we get around to shooting it. She's some kind of crook? Well, some kind of radical. A anyway, there's there's some more shops there, and, and the boy thinks she's been looking at these dolls. Which doll? Well, the one she... he thinks she was looking at. So, well, he goes in and, and buys it for her. Man, I've had to explain things like that. And you're just like, oh, there's more holes in this than I realized. Usually it's in the writing process, though. Um, this clip is related to the to the other one, and uh, they, they find out that maybe there isn't such a, a tight script that they're working from here. There is going to be film showing that there's a doll in this package. Oh, sure, that's easy, Max. Just, just an insert. And the bomb? And if there is a bomb, when does it blow up? Well, well we, we, we don't actually know. What do we know? You, you better ask Jake. I'd better read the script. Oh, there is a boy. Jake is just making it up as he goes along. He's done it before. Yes, can he do it again? Yeah, so that bomb reference, I think, was a reference to Touch of Evil, which opens up with a bomb being put in the trunk of a car. And uh, we were watching for 10 minutes, waiting for it to explode. Um, so that probably was a reference to that. But um, yeah, finding out that you don't have this, have an actual script you're working off of, that can be problematic for uh, producers who might invest in your project. So just saying. Um and uh, here's uh, the lovely uh, voice of uh, John Houston cutting into a younger uh, upstart director who has taken his style and um, basically stolen his, his technique and become famous for it and maybe uh, more well off than, than he. But I, oh, and, oh shit. So but what it was, it worked. Yeah, well, she wasn't that kind to me in her review. Not that you did me too much harm. I mean, how much harm can you do to the third biggest grocer in movie history? They make that much How marvelous. Yes, uh, did you know that when his own production company goes public, that your friend there stands to walk away with $40 million? Yeah, and she's going to say that I'm just going to keep on writing that I, I, I stole everything from you, Skipper. I'm never going to walk away from that. But it's all right to borrow from each other. What we must never do is borrow from ourselves. Come on. <laughs> Gandalf's right. I just can't not hear him as Gandalf. I love it. I love his voice. Um, yeah, and they did a lot of like frantic cutting, more filmmakery stuff, which I, I could because this was before like found footage and mockumentaries was really a thing. And this may have been if it was released in a time period that was timely and might maybe more in, in line with what they thought they would release it. It probably would have been one of the first ones, I imagine. Um, so they didn't really have the kind of film language, but I think that if I was going to, um, levy a criticism, 
Uh, I suspect it was supposed to feel more like a documentary, the way they cut between different cameras all the time. Um, and that, I guess, works okay. But I think when they use different sound sources on purpose, that was I found that particularly jarring. And then you'd hear like a lot of like ADR voices, uh, which is recorded after the fact. And it just kind of felt cobbled and disjointed. And, and um, it gave it almost like an abstract aesthetic. Like there was sort of one more degree away from feeling live to me. Did anyone else feel like that or have trouble kind of like digging into the story because of that? Yeah, I felt the same way with the visuals uh, when they would repeat the same clip over and over. They did it a couple, I think only like two or three times, but they just played like the same video clip like four times. Like there was one where it's like a bunch of a bunch of them with cameras like all rushing forward and they'd play it like over and then they play it again and then they play it again. It's like, OK, what's why? Who, who, what, what filmmaker would ever make the decision to do this in this documentary they're making about the making of this movie? Um, yeah, I think they did it one other time, but that was very like, what is happening? That kind of slipped past me. So was that in uh, the actual documentary part or the movie within a movie part where they did that? The documentary part. There was there is one. Yeah, it's one where they're all moving forward with cameras. And I think the other is they're like putting a boom mic in someone's face. And then it's like the same shot of them putting the boom mic in their face. And then again, for no apparent now, reason. See, yeah, that makes me wonder if like they did that because it was the 70s and they thought they could get away with it or if that was done on purpose. But I imagine with someone like Orson Welles, who is known to be very detailed, he's the detail guy. He's the deep focus guy. I wonder if he did that on purpose for some reason, or he's making fun of the way that the seventies filmmakers were doing their thing. It was hard. It's hard because, because the era it came out with the era it was shot in, it came out in our era. The era it was shot in is so long ago, it's hard for me to tell, again, where that line is kind of blurred in a difficult way where I'm just, I'm not reading it in the context that I might if it, if I actually saw it back then when it was intended to come out. I'm really curious to know what Pepe thinks. I haven't heard from him. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's have it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well... I guess I'll say, I think that this, I think that, or my impression is that Orson Welles is basically like pointing his guns like behind him or sort of behind him to his contemporaries and to his antecedents, the people who are currently working. Because I think it's a send up of both. He's, John Huston is like the perfect person to cast as the aged director, right? Because John Huston mm -hmm. is like, I don't know. He, I guess he's not golden era, right? But he's like, he's like treasure the Sierra Madre, like the the African Queen, like these classic. You know, he straddles different eras for sure, and yeah, although yeah. he had staying power, unlike some of the other ones, yeah, yeah, and he he has that. Um, so he he's like, I, I'm actually sort of surprised John Huston allowed himself to be <laughs> put in this movie since it, it, he seems like such an on the nose. Uh, decision to be the sort of caricature that he was looking for. And then you have this movie that he's making in the movie that we see, which is, um, I guess, supposed to be a parody of those types of movies that were getting made in the, like, post-Haze Code time, right? Because now you can do whatever you want in a movie, so let's do it all, you know? <laughs> we'll put it all on screen. We'll do it. We'll do everything. Um, and I think that, and so I think he's, he's, he's fighting and he's having a war on two fronts. He's looking behind himself or, or to sort of his contemporaries and saying, I am not them. And that's true. I mean, that's like, that's like the reason Orson Welles became like a persona non grata is because he was like such this fresh face on the scene and he wanted to change it all right that's what that's why he became famous because he was such an innovative uh and different movie maker at the time and he had his sort of period and then hollywood was like look man we don't want you he was also sort of a jerk from what i understand um but he was sticking to his guns right he had this new way that he wanted to make movies and the sort of old school hollywood didn't want to do that so they pushed him away and he went away sort of gladly and that, and then I think he saw 
something he didn't like in the new this new kind of movie that was being made, which is the movie that John Huston is making in this movie. Um, and you can sort of see why. Like, it's not, it's very abstract. It's almost avant-garde, right? It's very abstract. Um, Big time. There, yeah, there's like, there's barely any plot. Um, you don't really know what's going on. Um, it's very psychedelic. Um, and you also see that in the in the actual like fake documentary part of the movie too, when they switch back between, like any time that they're at that party and you get to see a color shot, it's like all of these lights that's like purples and blues and greens are like, and you don't get the, you don't get that sense when it's in black and white. And when you get those brief moments of color, you're like, oh shit, this is like a scent. These people are like a sensory overload going on right now. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, I think that is the sense that I got. And, and I, I think what you guys have been talking about too, is like a perfect, or I guess a way that at the time, one would sort of like stick it to a guy like John Houston, right? So like this like masculine man is like, well, we'll make him gay. We'll emasculate him. Right. Um, and, and, and portraying him like um, that poet, uh, I don't remember his name, um, not Oscar Wilde, the other one. Um, Ginsburg? No, they, they talk Hemingway. about Hemingway. Yeah. Yeah. Hemingway, who was like, oh, the sort okay. of like outdoorsman. And he even wore, a, he, he, John Houston was dressed like Hemingway in this movie, like that that coat he was wearing and everything. Uh, that's like a perfect way to do that, right? Is like portray him as this really sort of like womanizing uh, masculine man, and then it's like, well, it turns out he's gay, so he isn't, you know, right? And then and then these other these other people, they, I don't know, I think I think the 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 male actor sort of comes off the best in this movie because he sort of realizes that. Uh, he, I think, realizes that he's being exploited and walks mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. um, the woman character, the the woman who's supposed to be a, a Native American, I'm not quite sure what her relation to the movie is because she sticks around. She's she's there the whole time, but she doesn't seem to really be participating in any of it. And so maybe she's mm -hmm. just like Except supposed the to be shown as just like, yeah, right supposed to be shown as just like tolerating it like this is the state of the industry right now women are still like not you know actresses are are, are just sort of like because they were like that in old in the older movies too they were femme fatales they were like arm candy for the for the male He's, leads you know and he was particularly cruel to her during that sort of mock award ceremony when he was kind of lashing out he was angry and maybe heartbroken about uh the actor and kind of yeah. took it out on her. Um, and she, I guess, took it in stride, uh, cut around the room, and you could see people being, like, kind of cringing at what he was doing. Um, yeah. But, you know, no one really called him out on it. Um, yeah. I think that the way you're speaking about it and reading it, I did eventually get there. And if that was his intention to sort of poke at what was going on in the 70s, I'm with him. Um, because a lot of those techniques um, became, they were popular and hip and new in the 70s, you know, the sh the smash zooms and stuff like that, uh, and the quick cutting and, and the abstraction and the color and stuff. Um, they didn't really have staying power, and they really became like tropes yeah, right. of that era. Um, and I never particularly liked them, even in, when I was growing up uh, in the 1980s, when I would see stuff from the 70s, I was like, Jesus, what what is this? Like, you know, it was I like know, yeah. already it, it moved. It it left like hair bands when Nirvana came around. You know, it was it was a quick transition out of that. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was era. it was disco, right? It was it came Exa on, okay, there it, you go. It burned quickly, Perfect right? analogy. Yeah, burned itself out real quick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um uh, yeah, cocaine is a hell of a drug, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm not I, sure I think, what explains um, it, but uh, I'm with them on that. Like, yikes, you know. I think that I think that where the movie, I think the mistake, like quote unquote, that this movie makes, if you can call it that, is like mm -hmm. is is achieving what it what it wanted to do too well in the sense that like in the sense that like. Um, like rocking in the free world is way too good of a rock song for it to ever be appreciated as a protest song, right? 
No one thinks right. of that movie, that song is a protest because it's too good. Right. In the same yeah. way that like Hendrix's version of the stars of the um, national anthem is too good to be seen as like a protest song. Right. But it's so. Yeah. No, obviously I, is, you know. Yeah. I'm smoking I mean, what you're passing but around here. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'll, and so I'll, I think. I got gotcha. you. I, I think Orson Welles does such a good job of of like making the six that 60s 70s style movie that he wants to lampoon he's just so good he can't do it poor like he just does it too good right he's like, like tap dancing around it in a way that yeah <laughs> it was hard for me and, and like i said this a couple times just not being of that era it's harder for me to know what he was doing there it took a while for me to catch on but yeah i'm mm -hmm. with you i think he was He's like, yeah, I'd be bopping and scatting all over that thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember, like, that scene that you, we talked about earlier where he's, like, directing the, the male actor to, like, do all the stuff to the woman. Yeah. Like, the way that that was shot and the angles by which it was shot and how you see them, like, laying on that bed that's just the springs, like, mm -hmm. that those were so visually interesting that you're just like, I don't care about this other creepy stuff that's, good. like, you still, like, uh -huh. you still sort of, like, recognize it but you're like this is an incredible shot like look at how mm -hmm. the like springs press against their skin and like the angle that it's done at and everything yep. it's incredible and so like he, the fault is that he's too good at making movies <laughs> to like pull, i agree i think like ultimately pull off what he wants to do um and i guess it, i'll just the I, i've been going on for a long time but I, my one last thing i want to say is i thought it was interesting that he gives the last line though to John Houston, and I think it's supposed to be a sort of coda of the film. Yeah, it and is. I would be interesting to see what you guys thought about it. I, I have the line here. He says, "He says, who knows? Maybe you can stare too hard at something, huh? Drain out the virtue, suck out the living juice. You shoot the great places and the pretty people, all those girls and boys. Shoot them dead. <laughs> I, yeah, that's such a great." <laughs> shoot him dead that's such a great line at the end it really and was I, and there was a lot of good lines in this but that one particularly was like nice. yeah. yeah and i think that might be i think that might be the one point at which in in this movie where wells is putting himself as the character i think he's asking himself this question like what are these movies what are we doing with these girls and boys basically what what is what is this like enterprise that we've invested ourselves in so so heavily? Mm -hmm. mm. And I would say and it that, makes sense reflecting at the end of his life. Yeah, and I and I was gonna say I think the the ending specifically because then you had talked about like how you don't you felt like there wasn't really like a clear point to that it's very blurred lines in regards to the satire. And I could understand that for the majority of the movie, but I feel like the very end, you have, I believe, only the actress herself watching the movie. I think she was the last one to leave. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, of her playing herself. And obviously, he, you know, the director gets in, you know, because of his drinking, gets into a car accident and dies, all that. It's really, tr the ending is really sad and like tragic, even though it's very brief it and short. It's very like, you know, um, reflective on like, and, and in a very different tone from the rest of the movie. Because the rest of the movie is very chaotic. It's very moving. There's a lot of humor. There's all this going on. And at the end, it's very like lonely and very sad. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that the way he chose to end the movie and what he specifically said was really to say, um, you know, Hollywood has all this glitz and glamour, but at the end of the day, what are we really doing and what is the input that we are having? And and are we, you know, back to the kind of the conversation of exploitation, you know, like, are we exploiting people just to, just to have, I don't know, a good laugh or to be entertained? I don't know. That's kind of my interpretation of the end, which is why it really drove the point of like, this was very intentional on the director, that this is very much a satire because there's a point that he was making it all so. i think with that he kind of did deliver that part that i was needing to see it for what it was and i think that um talking about the end 
kind of clarified to me that, yeah, there was maybe that line wasn't so invisible, but it was just a long time coming. So I spent a good portion of the film wondering if they would get there, if they would make that comment. Um, to Pepe's point about them, about him being too good to like make something bad or something. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, scene in the car when the girl kind of climbs into his lap and she's like making love to him. It reminded yeah, me yeah. of the movie Delicatessen where uh, the, like they use the sound of all everything going on in the world and the building to like be orchestrated by this guy uh, having sex. Uh, and I thought it was really clever. In fact, this movie reminded me of a, a lot of movies. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some other ones, but this particular scene is just all about the sound. And uh, she climbs into his lap in the back of a car and they start making love and um, it just kind of, of everything car. becomes in sync. Uh, I thought it was in the back seat. It wasn't in the back seat. No, I no, it started. It started in the back seat, but it almost got so chaotic. They were going in the front seat and then it felt like they were trying to get the driver involved. Yeah. Well, yeah. The driver it was wanted weird. to get involved. No, the driver involved. inserted himself. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the, the point, the he part that I, himself. yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Um, definitely. Um, that was, yeah, there was an attempt. Um, but, uh, the part that I'm focusing on here was just, I was really kind of, got lost in the abstraction for a second. And I really enjoyed what they did with the sound, like kind of bringing it together and almost like an orchestral sound effect kind of thing he did. No, that, that whole sequence with them in that car was great. It was great. Yeah. yeah. It was like, Oh, this is supposed to be bad, but I actually really like this part. So I'll, I'll play that. Yeah. I love good sound design and uh yeah it was very abstract and like psychedelic visually as well and um it was just like oh this is actually pretty cool but has anyone seen delicatessen Do you, does anyone know that yeah. scene that i'm talking about pepe you yeah, know yeah. It? okay yeah yeah could you see where i'm i'm seeing the parallel there yeah well now that you bring it up i do i do yeah but when but I was, this was watching, done before that, right? So yeah, yeah. When I was when I was watching that scene, I used to have a Mustang like that, and I was like, "You can't do that in the front seat of a Mustang." Uh, <laughs> There's room. room up there. Yeah. No, no way. Yeah. Um, it also reminded me of this movie, Living in Oblivion. Has anyone seen that? It was 1995. Steve Buscemi, or Buscemi? No, or I'm not. It's uh it's another one that if it was available, I might have uh, submitted it for this because it's a mockumentary about. A bunch of filmmakers um, trying to make a movie in that like kind of '90s indie era, um, which is worth a watch. But it wasn't uh, wasn't streaming either. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe mockumentaries is a deeper well than I first uh, thought it might be. We might revisit this down the road at some point. Yeah, you know one one thing I forgot to mention is that I think that I think not only is I think this is a I think this is basically an anti everybody but Orson Welles movie because all of the people that be. are trying to like uh, interview. All of the like critics that are trying to interview John Huston's character, mm -hmm. they're asking him like these stupid questions, like the like those guys that are like, "Is the world a reflection of the camera, or is the camera a reflection of the world, or is it just a penis?" You know, it's right, like, right. Fuck, get out of here! What kind of question is that? <laughs> That's yeah. why he like. And so he's yeah, just yeah, like, to critics don't know out. shit from Shinola. They're asking me questions like this, you know. <laughs> which I thought, yeah. Which also reminded me of Malcolm and Marie because he did that great yeah, takedown right. of the critic. Go ahead, Devin. I was just going to say, yeah, it feels like there's very deliberately no likable characters in this film, except for Pitzer. Uh, Pitzer was the only nice guy. 
He just showed up a couple times. He was just always like a nice guy. He's the one who got Which kicked one out of the he? car at the beginning. He gets kicked out of the car and oh, then yeah. he gets in another car that breaks down and gets picked up again. And then he like, at one point he comes in to just like deliver some exposition. He's just like, he's the one who points out the camera. He's like, there's also like a camera there and there. Like yeah, he's right. that guy. I, just, I don't there's know. I like that guy. Yeah, cameras all over the place. Yeah, that was a pretty funny scene, actually. That that felt like more modern filmmaking, uh, more of what they would do in something like The Office or or, or something with a more modern mockumentary. Um, yeah, if, if this film hadn't come out in 2018, I would say it seems like it inspired a lot of other works, but it, it couldn't have. I know, that's, <laughs> it's yes, so crazy. That, see, now you're hitting on the point I'm trying to make. It kept reminding me of things that came out after it, um, which I would have thought, you know, they would have harkened back to this, but no, nobody has seen it. Um, it also kind of had dazed and confused um, tones towards the end when it was kind of like the party winding down. It felt very like dazed and confused for like over the hill filmmakers or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know what? I forgot to mention uh, to Kat's point about him uh, dying at the end. Do you guys think that maybe he was knew he was going to like do himself in like knew that it was over and um, goes and crashes on purpose? Maybe um, I'm not saying it's like an objective thing, but it's something that occurred to me. He also tried to get the, the young actor in the car with him before he took off there in the end. You know, that that had crossed my mind, too, but I, I I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it was like explicitly like like hinting at it but it just kind of occurred to me that you know he had, he knew it was over and he like kind of assaulted that critic or whatever uh and right, yeah. uh, had been called out and i think he knew it was over and he was i think i like to read it as though he was gonna thelma and louise that shit um <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but uh yeah it's not explicit but i was curious if anyone else caught that or thought that i didn't think that but now that you've said it um i'm just thinking back on the movie and, and it does seem he does have a very much like i don't give a fine fuck of what happens attitude throughout the whole movie and yeah. and maybe that's like his personality who he is in general and that's how they were trying to characterize him but now at least with, with in, in in regards to that context of whether or not he tried to um, and whether or not he knew he was going to do that, it, it does feel like throughout the movie that he almost didn't care and that he knew that it was going to kind of end anyways. You know, yeah, when he, I, almost, when I, he almost seemed fatalistic or something. When I, when, at the beginning of the movie, when I saw that car and the crash, I was like, oh, is this going to be about James Dean? Because that's how mm -hmm. James Dean died, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering if that was uh an intentional illusion i wonder um, that too it feels like they were picking pieces from hollywood lore from decades yeah. before this running up to this and 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 utilizing stuff very much how the blair witch project picked little pieces of of urban myths to kind of create a new one i feel like they kind of cobbled together different things like that and different elements that we would recognize at least uh maybe subconsciously but yeah, I, I had thought that too. I also thought someone was going to kill somebody else. Was that just my Columbo thing? Uh, no, I totally, I totally thought that too. Especially when those guns came out. I was like, oh, here we go. Yeah, someone's about to get shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was, speaking of other movies that came out after Vibes, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I definitely got that kind of, I mean, ob for obvious Big reasons. Time. But like, yeah, yeah very clearly um, had some, some pins and needles there. No, and I wondered while I was watching this, like, I, I and I was like, man, I wonder, I would love to be like a fly on the wall when Tarantino screened this and just kind of saw what his commentary or whatever would be. Because, you know, this is stuff feet. he... Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably not. That would be uh, his, one, his criticism. Could not use more feet. feet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure quick... Tarantino would okay, have loved this. No, I'm yeah, I was going to say it's like his bread and butter, so it would have been yeah. neat to kind of uh, hear what he had to say. In fact, someone must have asked him about this, and if not, I'm sure they will at some point. Um, geez, have you seen this one? Of course he has. Um, yeah, here's like the kind of final meeting with the crew, you know, of filmmakers kind of coming to the realization that they are on the other side of the wind and maybe it's over for them. You know, they're not going to get this one done. And I thought that was kind of a nice bit 
uh, uh, there of kind of like, it was endearing, like, because a lot of filmmakers use the same people for, and especially the, the, the ones who have staying power, like Scorsese, right? He probably has people on that has been with him for like 40 plus years. And so they got the old crew back together to try to like figure this sucker out and they're not going to, they're kind of realizing it's not going to happen. And um, so I'll play that. I think it was one of the nicer scenes. How's the boy? And you, Billy? Jake, I just told you. Kept you busy just collecting school teachers? Hey, can I please get myself something to eat? I wasn't just collecting school teachers. Didn't they feed you? All they do on airplanes is feed you. Turbulence. Ooh. You threw up. Give him some candy, Billy. Jake, those oil guys. Keep the voices down. These freaks got the whole joint wired for sound. I got one of them bugging a cactus. What about the oil guys? Don't be bashful, Hermie. We know the answer. They want no part of us. Neither does Max. Right, Billy? Yeah. Max David, that dirty crook, who needs him? We do. Max, he's so crooked he's got rubber pockets so he can steal soup. Our best chance was that oil money. Otter Lake, well, what about him? Yeah, what about me? Brooksy, well, we wondered if you knew about the screening at the drive-in. We're screening the rest of the movie. He's seen the movie. He's seen it. Yeah, so that also kind of felt very Tarantino-esque to me. Uh, and the with the witty banter and stuff like that. It's just kind of a nice, endearing moment. God, geez, these guys are, you know, kind of petering out here, unfortunately. But there's clearly, like, a lot of history there. And that, and I felt that when they were playing through that scene. I like that they mentioned that they were bu- caught on bugging a cactus and they're talking right next to a cactus and are clearly being Which recorded. Which is clearly bugged. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was a nice kind of self-referential thing there as well. Oh. So what was up with all the dummies? That was so funny to me. That was yeah, it was very weird. <laughs> I didn't notice them until they really started shooting them, but I, I guess they were in the background for a lot of it. So maybe I just missed that. But um, there was a lot, uh, a lot to shoot. And yeah, I'm surprised that someone didn't take a shot at the director. But we know he ended uh, in the car crash or whatever. So I don't know. I thought someone was going to get shot in that point. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess it, maybe it has something to do with the theme of the film. I, I kind of missed that. That was not, that was lost on me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that last line that you, uh, you guys yeah. said. Well, yeah, it could have also, cause they were made to look like the kid, the, the, the boy, I forgot his name. Mm. And, uh, it, part of him being a phony, you know, that he's a dummy. Like he, he was a fake mm. the whole time and the dummies are fake. I don't know. Could be. It's more meta stuff. Um, I'll play the scene where he was kind of being the drunken bully and um, saying stuff that wouldn't cut the muster uh, in today's era. Uh-uh. There, there, was a, there was a bit of that, a bit of the cringy yeah. stuff that didn't age well. Um, but I think, again, he isn't, he isn't uh, as a filmmaker, I don't think Wells is supporting this kind of talk or whatever, um, or action. Oh, I think this, he's, this, this is the award. Show. No, oh, okay. no. Um, but that came up a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, thematically, and uh, he did say it. But no, this was about like um, talking about like how they Native Americans died off, and they were like, and then white people were. Oh yeah, they dis- yeah. they disappeared magically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that he was um, also making a comment on this, uh, not necessarily in support, but it was a weird scene. Gentlemen, ladies, we are presenting an award to the other half, the other side of the wind, the uh, better half, a bone for Pocahontas, a little curio we picked up somewhere, a bit of our own pale-faced craftsmanship, Indian bone. The inscription goes back to before all this was movie country. Just after gold was found, the Indian population dropped pretty quickly. And in uh, 10 years, about uh, 90,000 of them just uh, disappeared. Well, in those um, good old days, our gallant honky pioneers 
Uh, used to uh, cut off Indian ears and pickle them in whiskey for souvenirs. And on uh, pieces of bone like this, they'd um, write funny little jokes. I am off the reservation at last. And so are you, my dear. Perhaps you'd like to present this to our leading man. Right up his ass. Okay, that wasn't weird or awkward or anything. Um, yeah, I have to imagine even at the time, that would have been a pretty weird scene to shoot for like most of the people involved. Like, he, uh, here's a, a shard of one of your like dead people that was stolen from them and like, like, you know, desecrated with this joke. Like that's just horrible at any point in history to do. Yeah, right. Exactly. It was, uh, right. it was pretty horrible. And I don't think, yeah, I think he was more like calling out, uh, people who would think that that was in, in decent taste or, or even if, I don't know, I think the character knew it was in poor taste too. Maybe I, I'm not sure. A lot of the stuff was kind of lost to that era to me, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I well, I mean, I think that that's probably also a send up of of just like Hollywood making, you know, like untold millions of dollars off westerns, and especially just because of that area being the way it is. You know, I mean, it's like that area of Hollywood is like it's the West, right? Like that's you know, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think Orson Welles is getting his digs in wherever he can. <laughs> that must be it, right? Yeah, he was like talking about that exploitation, and Hollywood was still making a lot of westerns in the seventies. In fact, one might argue some of the best westerns were made in the seventies. Well, I, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's talking about uh -huh. two whole different types of exploitation too, like mm -hmm. or many different types. I guess I could should say, but I guess you would say like the exploitation of like the plight of the Indians that or the native Americans that is being sort of like lessened by these Westerns. Right. And then you have the exploitation that's being done of just like people, the people that are acting and being filmed in the movies that are being made in the like post haze, right after the, the haze code was abolished. Yeah. They're just like, whatever, let's get their clothes off and, and put a camera on them. And we'll, pent up you since know. they in, it started that in the thirties. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like, because like that's the time when like black exploitation movies were being like all the exploitation movies were made in that era, right? You know, yep, all of them. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he's he, it's it's funny though because like he's a he is a part of that. He's a part of that. He's a wheel within that machine of Hollywood, right? And he knows that. And then, and I, yeah, I, I mean, he when he points the fingers at others, he's got to point a finger at himself too. Um, and maybe that's why he puts that, that last line why he has John Houston's character say that last line. Cause I think, I think of any of the people in that movie, he would have to be the closest analogate to Wells himself. Right. Oh, absolutely. It would have to be him of it, of anyone in that movie. It would have to be him. Did Wells, make an appearance in this i thought i might have spotted him in the beginning but I, I it's hard to say what he looked like during this time um i didn't see him but i might have missed him i can't i, I saw actually see him. i saw an onset photo when i was looking through uh some stuff of the three of them and at the time orson wells looked pretty distinct he actually looked a lot like john houston's character and like it was he looked very similar to him but with like more of a beard and a little more hair and i think he would have stood out pretty starkly in the crowds of this film if, if he was there you probably would have spotted him but he could have been in the background could have done a walk through i don't know yeah if he was that distinct then he i probably would have uh, saw him right away he looked like santa claus basically i think what yeah exactly <laughs> I think I had the idea that he was in this and then so I was kind of looking for him more in the beginning and then when I realized that uh John Hughes uh um uh did I say John Hughes John Houston was um going to be his surrogate or whatever for this movie um that I realized that that that's the direction they were going. I don't know why I thought he would be kind of the main guy in this other than 
I guess he was the main guy in some of his other movies, uh, and he was a yeah. big role in uh, a Touch of Evil as well. So it's almost too bad, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to complain about John Huston. And frankly, I just I kept wanting to say uh, Bilbo Baggins. Like, oh, every <laughs> oh, time. I just wanted him to say it one time. <laughs> Do you have Love a that. clip of the of the final line of the movie? Do you have that? I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't grab that line, but it was very well said. It's it's and, so well delivered. Yeah, yeah, it's it's worth a watch. So that that'll be the uh, the bait for people to actually uh, go check yeah. this out. Yeah, um, I'll do one last clip and then we can uh, maybe share our final thoughts and go to to our uh, commercial break. But this is uh, the critical takedown when the critic kind of uh, comes directly at him and um, tries to out him, basically. And the um, possibly um, predictable outcome. Preferred by whom, Mr. Hannaford? You gave her the gun. Well, what does that mean? What's it supposed to mean? Don't worry. Even if she doesn't know, she'll tell us. Miss Valeska, you made just one film with Mr. Hannaford. Yes. Now, Garvey, Glenn Garvey was your leading man. Now, it is true, isn't it, that during the shooting of that film, Mr. Hannaford had an affair with Garvey's wife? Men are the subject of his films. And whoever the man is, naturally, he's got a girl, right? And whoever she is, somehow, finally, Hannaford seduces her. He must. He has to possess her because it's the only way that he can possess him. We'll have to stop this, you know. Okay, okay, cut it, you guys. Expensive vice, isn't it? After he's had his actor's girl, he throws her away. And then he's thrown his actor away and destroyed him in the process. Maybe that's what you really want. Oh. yikes yeah and so <laughs> after that uh the party kind of winds down uh and people take off and he drives off in the faded car um towards the end i think he gets one more scene when he finds the lead actor and tries to get him to hop in the car with him but yeah. uh and and then we have the line which i did not get but uh, is worth uh is worth the watch just to get to there um, any uh, final thoughts or anything you guys want to explore before we uh, wrap up and go to commercial break? Yeah, it was a weird, so. wild ride, um, but one yeah. worth taking. And, uh, you know, one of the most groundbreaking entertainers and filmmakers of any generation, but uh, certainly one who helped establish uh, the medium in, in the way that we still enjoy it today uh and his take on what happened in the 70s it took me a little while to get my footing but once i did i was uh in for the ride with no expectations other than to sort of let it unfold and uh was pleasantly uh rewarded for that so good uh good um submission there cat and um so now that we've wrapped up it is time for a short commercial break and now, a word from our sponsors. Uh, hello, friends. Uh, Mr. Wells was supposed to lend his iconic voice for this commercial, but apparently he has more important things to attend to. So here goes. Hello, I'm legendary filmmaker and life coach Orson Welles. Uh, known not only for my groundbreaking work in entertainment, but even more famously for reliably submitting my project deliverables on time, like clockwork. So, if you want to learn how to manage your time like me, just send in a self-addressed stamped envelope, along with, say, a hundred bucks, to Orson Welles Time Management Seminar, location TBD. That's right, reserve your slot for this upcoming... Wait, you say it's not ready? Well, when are we scheduling? He says it'll be done in how long? Four to eight years? Oh, I misheard, of course. 48 years, you say? We're going to need a disclaimer. Disclaimer, this seminar is guaranteed. Guaranteed to be pushed back time and again. We reserve the right to continually reschedule Orson Welles' time management seminar with little to no notice. Orson Welles' time management seminar, because true genius can't be rushed. <laughs> Ah, the French. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing I think I want to go. Oh my Wells. God! Right? 
Yeah. Oh, uh, the French. <laughs> I want to play that right now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a good one. Has everyone seen the uh, the commercial and the send up of that? Oh man. Talk about send ups. The commercial is yeah. bad enough. The send up is the pretty funny brutal, though. Dude. Oh what yeah, is it, what it is. Is it? he's doing some, a wine commercial and he's just shit faced, and they just trying to corral Orson Welles into doing this <laughs> commercial. Is uh, hilarity ensues. Yeah, try to direct the master when he's drunk, and see what it gets you. Yeah, if you haven't seen that clip, it's worth checking out. Although it's also a little bit, there's a touch of sadness in, in it <laughs> yeah, as well right. because of how far he'd fallen. But he never gives up. <laughs> take no, after he sure take. Doesn't. He keeps trying. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, now it's time to grade this sucker. Poetry. Sheer poetry. Right. A plus. So uh, like I said, um, this one was well worth the ride. Um, I think there were some problems with me trying to interpret it and i still don't know if it was if i can pin it down to just being from a uh begotten era that's that's long past um i i suspect that's part of it i think that if this had come out in a timely fashion and not taken 48 years um that i think that it would have probably played more easily as the satire it was intended that said, it was definitely worth a watch, and I enjoyed um, seeing Wells's last project. And I intend to watch the um, "They'll Love Me When I'm Dead" uh, documentary after the show to kind of just fill in, and I'm sure it will be quite illuminating. Uh, for this one, I was kind of struggling, maybe on a B or a B minus, but it doesn't feel right giving it a B minus because I did enjoy it uh, a great deal. So I'm going to go with a B. Uh, for the other side of the wind. Kat, uh, where'd you land on this one? I think I landed on a B plus. I think there's a lot. I feel like with this movie, just like um, I, I, on another movie we've, we've, we've watched and discussed about, I feel like if I have, if I watch it a second time, I may be able to get things that I didn't get the first time that I may be able to appreciate it more. Or if I do more research on it, I may be able to, to appreciate it more. But there's a lot of things about this movie that's confusing or that I'm uncertain about as well. Um, and, and sorry, not a second time, I guess, a third time. Um, but I think there's a lot to it that has, um, I, that is that is entertaining, that's different, that's unique, that's um, also really special in regards to this specific genre. Um, that definitely uh, captivated me and get, kept me interest, you know, through my throughout the whole time that I that I watched it. So there's a lot of great things going for it, but it is, like I said, still confusing. Oh. And there's a lot of uncertainties, and it can be a hard watch. Oh. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. It's in that that Both range. It, um, yeah, and for me, it's one of those ones that I'm sort of, I feel like I haven't really entirely processed this one. So I'm going to have to kind of see how it goes as I sort of uh, digest it. And I think that also I might get more out of it in subsequent viewings, kind of like I felt with November. And I actually did watch that one twice where um, the first time was more trying to find my legs in that world. And then the second time I was able to just kind of focus more on the the story itself. So I think I probably would feel similarly about this one. Okay, so uh, Devin, what have you got for us on the other side of the wind? So um, I've been making an effort to try to be more positive in our general discussion. So I don't <laughs> sort of wet blanket the <laughs> conversation. Um, but I I really didn't get a lot out of this film uh it felt to me very much like a train that i really wanted to be on but i just couldn't quite catch up to and i kind of tried to leap on and it just sort of dragged me for two hours um so uh, for me it's a, a c minus and that's really that's like my generous grade i was gonna go lower but i think there i mean it's not like it's certainly not the hardest film to watch that we've watched as part of this podcast and uh, there were certainly enjoyable things about the way it was shot and uh, there were some jokes that definitely made me laugh so 
yeah, overall it was it was not unenjoyable to watch, but I just I I definitely know I missed the point. <laughs> but Devin, that rhythmic thumping when you're like hanging off the back of the train, <laughs> that was so cool, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, it was groovy, when brother. That, when that woman's necklace got caught on that guy's dick or something, <laughs> that was so confusing to me. Oh man, I think Do it was you, supposed to be his pubic hair. I'm Is pretty sure because she had the scissors and I don't think she was going to cut his dick off. I think she was going to like, <laughs> I, I don't know. know. This wasn't Jim's movie. Uh, the, the Santa. Oh, yeah. yeah right. was Very strange. For the, 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 for the cat to come in and run off with it, you know. <laughs> cool. Okay. So we've got a C minus. Uh, James Pepe, where did you land with the other side of the wind? Yeah, so uh, for me, this is this is either like an A minus or a B plus. I think um, sort of what similar to what you've been saying, Ben. This is this is like seeing a really good movie about a historical event that has no relevance to you. <laughs> that's I feel like <laughs> well, that's sort yeah. of what it's like. Um, uh, I, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a really good movie. Although there are some parts of it that are a little. I think there are some parts of it that aren't super like engaging and you're not really leaning into this every single scene of this movie. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it's there are radically genius, I think. Yeah, know? but there are parts of it that are just like, holy shit, this is incredible. Yeah, um, agreed. And so I think uh, I think B plus, I think it'll have to be a B plus. But I, I feel terrible giving movies like this even grades that low because they are so... Like, I wish everybody approached making their movie this way, where they're just like, I have an idea. I'm going to fucking lean into it as hard as I can. And I'm going to swing for the fences. And like, you, and yeah, those are, I just want like new and interesting stuff. And so, the parts yeah. that I didn't get, I trusted the filmmaker enough to to sort of like ride it out and see where it was leading. I think that had a big uh, part of it for me because I knew it was Wells and he is a master at his yeah. craft. Um, and I think that was also rewarded because I feel like there was peppered throughout this thing some really wonderful moments and some really genius filmmaking. Um, but uh, Jim, you get the final grade before we tally our GPA. Where did you land uh, with the other side of the wind? Yeah, so um, like you, Ben, I, I would give it a solid B. Um, it definitely was a period piece of the 70s. It was very clear from the beginning. You're like, oh, this is 70s. <laughs> Just oozing um, 70s. Yeah, yeah, there was no doubt. You, it's, 70s is very distinctive. Um, and with that being said, there it, it was challenging to decipher because uh, being a child of the 80s, I didn't watch a whole lot of 70s movies. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, it was more, I grew up with like the 80s movies, like the Goonies era, you know, on. And all, all of the movies that ensued. So it was a challenge. Some of the references they made, I uh, was like, and, and some of the things they decided to emphasize probably was big, you know, during that time. Um, not, a, not, not as uh, big now, or we just don't, it's kind of missed on us. Um, the dialogue was so interesting. Yeah. Even though I was kind of lost, and, and like you, and and I think it's this has been expressed in different ways by all of us. I was trying to get a grasp on what was going on. It was very chaotic. It kept moving. There was a lot of dialogue and things like that. So you know, just writing some of the dialogue down, something I thought was important to see if it would come back later. But the dialogue itself was very fresh. You know, it it, it felt fresh. Some of the things that were being said, I'm like, oh man. You know, that was such a some great of the stronger to... stuff. I think. Yeah. 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 Like lines like um, uh, when he was being kind of like poking at himself, he says, men like other men, queers like all women, mm -hmm. women keep men away from each other. I was like, they're wow. That's Smart really stuff. interesting. Yeah. Or when he was talking to the director and he says he likes nobody in the plural. individually. There are people he like, you know, like, like, man, what a great way to say that. That's so interesting. Cause I've met people in life that are that way. They really don't like people, but there are some individuals that they do like. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was interesting. Some of the scenes were really cool. And 
you know, even though I was lost, I wasn't like overly frustrated. I, I just kind of was just, I'm just going to keep going and see yep. what I can cobble together for myself. And I think that is a mark of a great movie, right? Because coming away with your own individual interpretation that you're not certain on, you're not sure on, but it is yours, you, you know, to be able to do that. Um, so anyways, yeah, I give it a B. Yeah, uh, and I, I, you kind of said it better than I did. I attempted to sort of put it in a way that, that made sense. And I think it's just because we grew up in an era after this and the era was so distinctive to that yeah. time that I think that it's just, I didn't know enough about it where uh, uh, probably swathes of it were lost on me, you know? Yes, exactly. So you, you put yep. it in a, in a good way um, that I was trying to kind of grasp for earlier. So thank you for that. Okay, so do we have uh, a GPA for The Other Side of the Wind? We do indeed. The Other Side of the Wind ranks in at a B minus 2.86, which, fun fact, is the exact score that Malcolm and Marie received. Wow. Weird. Weird. Yeah, Cat there. has an average this, now. <laughs> this, was a much better, this was a much better movie than Malcolm and Marie, I think. The numbers, the numbers disagree with you. I like them <laughs> the both. numbers. The yeah. numbers like I like gifts, them both exactly the same. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Uh, cool. Well, thank you for that submission. I, I did enjoy it. And um, we're seeing stuff outside of the scope of what I expected for mockumentaries. And that's been a pleasant surprise so far. But let's find out what we'll be watching for our final submission. Um, which we know is, oh, Jim has something can, to say. Can I make an entreaty at this point? I was sure. waiting and the dice rolled in the favor, so to speak, since I'm the last one. Mm -hmm. So just to give a full explanation and I'll make this mm -hmm. as, as succinct as possible. Um, mockumentaries was a weak, uh, genre for me, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least I thought at the time. Um, it's not a genre that I really watch, mm -hmm. uh, or thought I didn't. And the movie that I picked was one that I could remember having watched that wasn't so mainstream like District 9 or mm -hmm. Cloverfield, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I wanted to go with something that is different, but is very stereotypically uh, a mockumentary. And I honestly do not think it would be that interesting to discuss. In place of that choice, if you will allow me, since there's no guessing game um, as far as what movie it, uh, you know, uh, would be submitted by me. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ideal opened up when we watched the Blair Witch Project. I had totally forgotten about this movie, and I had mentioned it during that podcast. And it seemed to me that none of you guys had seen it. And I think it would be a more interesting movie to discuss. I think is another way to do a horror mockumentary that is different than the Blair Witch. And it got an underground following that really enjoyed it. Uh, so much so that they made an American version, which I do not recommend the American version. I do recommend the Italian version. It is a foreign movie, but it's easy to follow, if that makes sense. So I would Another like to foreign submit. Film. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I would like to submit that movie in place of what I had put, if that is okay with all of you. Yeah. Do, do we do have it. anyone that. Uh, okay. So everyone's on board. All right. Well, let me give you the drum roll dice, and then you can announce what it is and where it's streaming. How about that? So here sure. we go. One, uh, rolling that. One-sided dice. <laughs> All right. So the movie that we get to watch for next week is called Wreck, spelled R-E-C, short for recording for uh, those of you that uh, are born so early that you don't remember DVD players and VHS players. Um, it is available on Sling TV. Uh, with a subscription and also Amazon Prime, also with premium subscription. 
And what year oh, did that cool. come out? Oh, uh, Netflix as well. If you have the Canadian version or know how to access the Canadian version, um, I believe it came out in 2007, 2008, but I'm not exactly sure. So I am going to uh, ask Mr. Google that question. Okay. Well, we'll go ask. with uh, that that general era, but yeah, jump in there. So Rex on Sling TV, Amazon Prime, and Canadian Netflix, if you have a uh, VPN or whatever and can world hop to watch uh, different ver flavors of Netflix from around the world. Yes, and it's 2007. It was a 2007 okay, right. film. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. And um, it actually is time to roll for the next series theme since we've reached the penultimate Ooh. episode for the series. It's time to play Theme Jeopardy! So yes. because our show is really just a stack of dice all the way down, we're going to roll ever more dice and let fate decide the next series theme. So let's take a look at our categories. <laughs> Devin, the categories, if you please. We have Oscar losers that should have won. Adventure films, modern sci-fi, mind benders, music makes the movie, and Oscar winners. Okay, let's roll the dice. And Devin, you'll be uh, doing the honors here. Okay, let's roll the dice and find out what we will be uh, the theme of the uh, next series, series five. So here's your drum roll. And it is a six, which means we will be watching Oscar winners. Woo! Oscar winners. Okay. And surprise, surprise, gang. Oh, Since uh, series five. <laughs> sorry about that horrible sound bite. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jeopardy. I blame you. Um, so since, uh, since most of series five is going to take place in October, we're considering this a double jeopardy, uh, category for this theme. So it will be, uh, Oscar winners, uh, plus Halloween themed. And, uh, because that might narrow things down quite a bit, you can do quite a loose interpretation of those if you want, but we do want to do somewhat of a Halloween theme for October. So series five coming at you. Uh, in uh, three weeks from now, I believe. So, cool. Oscar winners slash Halloween. I have no idea what that will uh, uh -huh. what that will bring in, uh, but let's see what the Reaper reaps for that one in October. Um, okay, so fan emails. You can write to ben at redhenmedia.com and we may respond on the show and you uh, may earn yourself a... Uh, who Dundee award if you are our first emailer. Um, so email me and find out. Um, I think that just about wraps things up. Uh oh, who could it be? Believe it or not, it's not me. Just one more thing. It's Columbo, who I am surprised wasn't the guy in the movie that sounded exactly like Columbo. Um, Columbo is here. Lieutenant Columbo is here to tell us we have time for just one more thing where each co-host shares something from outside the show. Um, so I'll kick it off with a way downer. Um, well, I'll preface that with saying it's probably fine. My mom ended up catching a breakthrough case of COVID. Um, and this is someone who has received even her third shot of Moderna in the booster. Really? So oh, yeah. Wow. And so breakthrough cases happen, folks. Um, we're still in the middle of this thing. We have more people sick with COVID now than we're sick this time last year and uh, many yep. more in the hospital uh, with uh, several family members that work in the hospital. My mom doesn't, but I have other family members that do. They are dealing with people dying on a daily basis. So definitely, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and while the um, vaccines are uh, quite... Uh, powerful and effective uh, there's always exceptions so uh, just bear that in mind as you move forward and stay safe and healthy out there 
Um, and my mom is uh, doing okay, and she'll probably be fine. Um, her numbers look good and stuff. But, uh, yeah, it got her. She definitely got sick. So breakthrough cases happen. Um I'll just I'll just leave it at that. And uh, quick news: uh, this is probably going to be old by the time this broadcast. But I was very happy to hear that the uh, recall did not go through um, in California. So uh, Governor Newsom will continue at his post, and we will not have a weirdo Trump Republican crazy person in charge of California. So awesome little, little thing to celebrate there. Okay, I'll wrap it up with that. And uh, Kat, what have you have? Uh, what do you have for us this week on just one more thing? My Just One More Thing is another book. I'm a little bit late to the game for this one, but it's a pretty popular, well-known book called The Song of Achilles. Um, it's by Madeline Miller. And if you're into Greek mythology, this is definitely a great um, adaption of it, a modern adaption of it. So um, yeah, definitely check it out, read it. I'm still going through it. I haven't finished it, so I can't really fully say uh, if I like it or not, but I've heard really good things. So, song of, nice. of Achilles, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. It's the song of Achilles, right? The song of Achilles, yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Devin Schwartz. So um, I think I'm ready to admit to all of you that my just uh, one more thing is is sponsored permanently by Apple. Uh, um, because uh, <laughs> while I have not brought an Apple TV show to you, I have brought a book that has just been adapted into a show on Apple TV. Um, oh, it's weird. the Foundation, or just Foundation, by uh, Isaac Asimov, a classic oh, yeah, that yeah, I yeah, have yeah. never read, uh, had never read, I should say. I'm working my way through it, um, and I'm nice. really loving it. I always considered myself sort of a fantasy guy, really focusing on high fantasy, you know, Game of Thrones, one of your book series um but i've been kind of taking a, a dip into the realm of of sci-fi going to like the really classics and, and and i'm really enjoying them um as i was writing styles very interesting very unique um i can totally see why he was such a visionary and why this book alone has inspired all kinds of of uh, you know other pieces of media and uh yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's I'm about halfway through his his style is very fast paced. It covers huge like breadths of time. Like I've I'm halfway through the book and it's already been like over 100 years. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And uh, I bet the show is good, but I don't know. Yeah. The trailer got me interested. Is that what turned you on to the book? No, I actually didn't. I, I remember hear, hearing that it was going to be made into a series. I didn't remember where. Um, and, and then I saw the sticker on the book at the bookstore and was like, oh, I guess I'll check yeah, that I out. know nothing about it. But yeah, I bet that's helping book sales quite a bit. Yeah. And, and small bonus thing, if you are a Bay Area person, um, I got this from a chain of books or not chain. It's a, a group of bookstores in San Francisco that are locally owned. This is called Green Apple Books. You can barely see the bookmark oh, in there. Okay. It's too bright. But uh, it's right on the park, um, right by the Botanical Gardens. It's a beautiful little bookstore. And it's one of the few bookstores where like almost every book on the like fantasy sci-fi section looks really cool to me. They don't have like the like old like serial fantasy books that there's just like a billion of and they're all like really generic it's like all of them are really good picks like every book on the shelf is like i wanted to check out i had a huge stack that i had to like pare down when i was there last so um yeah highly recommend green apple books nice um yeah you know and i'm kind of remiss that i don't remember the name of it but i noticed that uh they that somebody has started like an online book buying marketplace um that's sort of like pitted against amazon in that you can buy books there but it's all the stock all comes from small bookstores and i'm sure you could oh, google wow. it and find it yes. but i thought it was a great idea and i wish it had come out you know 10 or 15 years ago to sort of compete with amazon back in yes. the day um but that does exist so if you're looking to buy books online i'm sorry i don't have the name in front of me i'll look it up uh either put it in the show notes or mention it next time but it does exist and uh, you go get whatever book you want. And then uh, you're supporting like local businesses that way. So uh, nice. pretty neat Absolutely. idea. And I'd like to see more of that in the uh, digital marketplace instead of just supporting uh, ginormous uh, companies that, uh, you know, make people pee in bottles so that their uh, founder can get shot into his space and come back. I mean, if he didn't come back, that'd be one thing, but he did. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think the one yeah. you're you're thinking about is called bookshop.org. Is it bookshop.org? Okay. I think so. Yeah. It, you order online, but then it like somehow they like source the books locally to where you are. So good. Thanks. Yeah. It's a it's a neat concept, and I'm I definitely I thought it bore uh, mentioning since Devin was talking about the group of bookstores there. 
Um, but what do you got for us this week, uh, James Pepe? Yeah, my friend and I the other night watched, um, uh, I would say this without hyperbole, possibly one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> um, I, like in a, a very serious way called Plan 9 uh, from the, Outer Space? <laughs> no, not Plan 9 from Outer Space. We, neither, neither of us had ever heard of this, but um, it was called The Astro Zombies. Now, one oh would imagine, God. one would imagine space zombies, right? No, Astro has nothing to, the way that they justify this name is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with like, it, it's just, they thought of a name and then they're like, ah, slap it on the movie. <laughs> um, but the reason why we uh, endured, or uh, we, we set ourselves to this task is because they had it on Amazon along with the Rift Tracks uh, overlaid it. Um, uh, and so if you don't know what okay. Rift Tracks is, um, it's the guys who did Mystery Science Theater and they, they're just doing the, they're doing the same Mystery Science Theater thing. Um, this one was like this. Th they probably did this movie because it was in public domain or it was really cheap to get the rights to. But they've also done they also were doing for a long time really current movies. Um, and they did um, one of the funniest uh, of all that genre that I've heard they did or I've seen was the one that they did for Casino Royale, the, the recent Casino Royale. It is so funny. So I would recommend uh, checking out Rift Tracks, especially the Casino Royale one. And uh, the Astro Zombies one was pretty good too, but man, was that movie so bad. Oh man, it was incredibly bad. I bet it was ripe for their <laughs> style of comedy for sure. Well, sometimes they can't overcome the terribleness of the movie. Sometimes they pick movies that even they can't like do. But this, what do they, they do? Were, they this shrug. I mean, well, make I, no, jokes. it's just like the movie. They can't, the movie's so bad that they can't even pull like good jokes out of it. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Um, but this one, and I found that to be the case with MST3K. I mean, everybody's got good ones and bad ones, you know, right? So. Um, yeah, but, I, uh, I can't sit through some of the MST uh, 3K stuff too. Some of the yeah, stuff that's yeah. just with the film just has no appeal to me whatsoever. So I get it. Yeah, I think Rift Tracks also has a channel running on Pluto TV as well, where you can just kind of oh, tune yeah. in anytime and catch it. And so does MSTK3. Yeah, they have okay. channels on there. Um, but I'm sure you can access it in a million different ways. Those those yeah. shows are out there for sure. Cool. And what do you have for us this week, uh, Jim Scott? Oh, uh, well, real quick, I I love Rip Tracks. Um, I forget the name of the horror movie they did. It was so good. Um, I think I've seen the Casino Royale, and I think they've also did like the first episode, of season one of The Walking Dead. Oh, so, really? Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah, I I think so. Yeah, um, I remember seeing it at least. I haven't seen it so. But um, speaking of horror movies, uh, you, you, I like to celebrate Halloween early. I mean, why not? All holidays go early. Uh, Easter, Christmas, what they start Christmas like before, way before Thanksgiving, you know. But um, horror movies come out during September. Horror mm -hmm. movies come out in October. There's a slew of them. So my uh, just one more thing. It is the season for sure. It is. Yeah. And it, this is my birthday month. So definitely I'm oh, going nice. to celebrate ho horror movies and things that go bump in the night all through. So just a couple of things um, that I'm either currently watching or have watched. Um, I didn't see uh, uh, how uh, the um, uh, uh, Haunting of Hill House. Uh, on netflix i started to watch it before and then stopped so i'm actually going to watch it through this time i'm three episodes away from finishing and man is it good and it, it is a ghost story uh you know haunted house ghost story that type of thing and i feel like part of the ghost story genre is mm -hmm. mixing tragedy in there and there's definitely tragedy uh you know abounding with this family, unfortunately, that has lived in this haunted house and th the damage, especially to the children um, later in life. I mean, it's just so good. Um, so, and then uh, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Um, that series uh, is a remake of, um, well, it's either a remake 
remake or an adaptation of a movie from the 60s called The Innocence. Oh, wow. Um, which is well worth a watch, Jim, after you finished up uh, The Haunting of Hill House. Nice. It was the OG, and I think the kids in The Innocence, that movie, uh-huh. are creepier even than the kids in The Hill House. Oh, wow. See, I didn't know that. I, I knew it was based on a book, but I, okay, I so didn't know that. must be different adaptations of the book then, yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, and then another movie that I just caught on uh, HBO Max. Uh, I'm not sure if it's currently on HBO Max, and if it is, it'll be a very short runtime. Uh, just because it's same day as you know, it's same as movie theater release is *Malignant*, um, the new James Wan movie, and it is really good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, he was the one that did. Um, uh, Yes, Conjuring, Conjuring 2. I don't know if he did some of the other ones that didn't do so well, but are set in that same universe. But he did this one, which is a a different take than that, you know, kind of kind of movie franchise. And I really enjoyed it. So cool. Yeah, I've enjoyed some of those. Uh, I I wanted to know if Devin would hate it or not. Uh Probably. Um, But Jim, have you heard? uh... (laughs) Have you heard of uh, Fear Street, the three parts? Yes. Yeah, um, that looked totally up your alley when I saw a trailer for it. Um, the, yeah, it's, yeah, for people who don't know, Netflix released another three part film series, very similar to Dracula um, called Fear Street. Uh, yes. One film taking place in 1994, one in 78 and one in yes. the 1600s, um, all kind of uh, maybe not parodying, but like sat- satirizing a, a certain era of horror, paying homage to a certain era of, there you of go. horror. It was more. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seemed a little can- like kind of, you know, slanting towards the campy side in the trailers, but I don't know. As- as many of those movies from that era were so true exactly it's fair yep. yeah but those did look good my wife actually watched those and she really enjoyed them so i'll have to check them out as well uh i i caught a scene or two and i was like oh this looks interesting um yeah and i, I thought actually, the whole movie was actually from the 80s so they did a good job of capturing that era yeah i actually have caught all three of them in part because uh not where i live now you know, i just recently moved but where i was living before i would have netflix netflix playing while i was going to sleep you know to have background noise and i would play those movies as i was going to sleep so i've caught very little of them but they looked interesting so you go to sleep to horror films that just lulls you into yeah. a general slumber joe why am i not doesn't surprised? anyone doesn't everyone <laughs> uh, i watched i watched documentaries for that to that end so yeah uh, and that's how I see some of them. I'll just rewatch them until I eventually, like, you know, six months down the road, will ca- have caught the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, oh, did you have something else you wanted to tag? No, I, was gonna, I was just going to throw a jab and say, I just turn off the lights and close my eyes like a normal person. <laughs> that's what I oh, watch. When I get uh, what era are you from? Uh, the 1850s? <laughs> yeah, <or> really? <laughs> <laughs> close your eyes. What the hell kind of fun is that? <laughs> you gotta be it's, everything has to be a multimedia experience come on even sleep <laughs> speaking of multimedia experience i think i'll miss you most of all no i'll miss my documentaries most of all so i'm gonna leave those on while i fall asleep uh dorothy is here letting us know it's time to say goodbye and i'm not crying you're crying Let's start with Kat, who's not crying. I'm Catherine Ramirez. It's been real. Catch me on Instagram at Kat Ramirez with two Z's. See you all next time. Yep. See you next week. And Mr. Devin Schwartz. I have been Devin Schwartz. You can find me at Devin Schwartz one on Twitter and game over, man. Game over. No more quarters. Okay. Or, the, <laughs> or just to put it in Zeppelin terms, no quarter. Um, and uh, on that note, James Pepe. Hey, uh, I've been James Pepe. Thanks for coming along with us and showing up and listening and watching. And uh, hope to uh, see you back next week. Yeah, absolutely. Stick with us next week when we're watching uh, Wreck on one of three streaming platforms. I'm going to go with the Canadian one myself. What about you, Mr. You Jim go. Scott? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jim Scott. Uh, it's been fun. I'm looking forward to next week discussing Wreck with all of my friends here. And uh, a fa- farewell, gentle listeners and friends.
Yeah. Uh, looking forward to that too. And farewell, everyone. Uh, and this has been I'll Look at Yours If You Look at Mine. And now that you've looked at ours, we hope to look at yours soon. If you enjoy the show, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, give us a five-star review, dot your I's, cross those T's, sign here, initial here, and don't forget to tell your friends. And remember to watch Wreck 2007, now playing on Sling TV, Amazon Prime, and Netflix Canadian for next week's show. Until next time, lookers, keep on looking!